Okay, welcome back. We're on page eight talking about the history of Java and the desire to be able to write an application once and then run it on practically any device. None of these other languages at the time had that capability. Java was the absolute first one to tackle the idea that I write something one time and it runs on all devices. Uh, C Sharp and Visual Basic are slowly eking the way into that, that Thing where it can run, for example, some of the applications can run on Linux and a few others, but Java was definitely there first. Okay, so I, I kind of described it about how the machine, instead of compiling directly to talk to Linux or directly talk to DOS or directly talk to Windows or, or Mac OS, uh, instead it takes it to some intermediate step. So here's kind of a... a, a way that thing works is, you know, you use a text editor to create a source file. The Java compiler takes it down to what's called byte code. And then the byte code then takes it someplace else. So once the byte code is created, it can run on this machine, or on Windows, on Linux, on Macs, and on Unix. That's how it works. Okay. Let me get back. Okay. So um, it's sort of like passing the buck. Instead of taking it all the way to the end, they run all the way up to the to the, the goal line and stop and say, okay, I've done my part. Now you have to have something installed on your machine that can interpret what this stuff means. And that is the Java Runtime Engine. Okay, so if you have a Java Runtime Engine installed on your Linux box, it'll take the ball and then run it over the goal line and you have an application. If you don't have the JRE installed, well then it'll say, I don't know what the heck you want me to do with this football, I'll just stand there like an idiot. So the Java Runtime Engine is the thing that takes it to the goal line. Now in our case, the Java Runtime Engine used to be this big monolithic thing that you installed, and now it's more so um, just the bits and pieces that you need get installed like on the fly. Okay, so on page eight continuing, it says, what are programs made of? Uh, okay, so programs are made of, you know, keywords. The common elements of practically all languages are keywords, operators, punctuation, variable, and syntax, those kinds of things. That kind of makes sense. So keywords are just those things that have special meaning, like the word integer. Okay, that's a special thing. You can't, you can't create a variable called integer because that's a keyword. Kind of makes sense. And operators like addition, subtraction, those kind of thing. And punctuations like commas and semicolons and parentheses and all those kinds of things. And then of course the syntax, which basically says, this is where you're gonna be spending most of your time is on trying to figure out how does that if statement go again? And I, I'm trying to do a while loop and I can't remember, you know, where does the semicolon go? Does it go at the end of the line or, you know, that, so syntax is what's gonna be driving you guys nuts. Okay. So I'm gonna do a very quick demo of Java just to show you what it looks like. All right, so um, I'm gonna minimize all this stuff and fire up good old NetBeans. Now I'm not really gonna to explain too much about what I'm doing because we've got plenty of time for that in other chapters. So just bear with me. So I'm gonna ask for a new project and a particular project type and then I'm going to call this one um, chapter one that's going to be the title of my application that I'm making uh, get it spelled chapter one okay cool and then it's going to create me a project dun, dun, dun. so it's going to have a bunch of stuff in it already when it starts up and uh, we're going to leave everything just the way it is. And right here where it says to do code application logic here, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go here and I'm going to, I'm going to type some stuff. Again, don't worry about what it is I'm typing and why I'm typing it because that's coming later. That's not what, that's not what this demo is all about. I'm going to type system dot out, uh, print LN. And then I'm going to say, hello world, which is somehow the obligatory thing that you're supposed to do. And then I'm going to put a, a semicolon at the end. Okay, I've written my first application. Hooray! So I'm going to run this to make sure it works. So this is like a little VCR button up here, a little thing that says run project. So I'm going to do that. And it 
it's going to take a second. It's going to have to go through and do some stuff. And then eventually, it's going to say, ta-da, hello world. And so there is my output from my application. Hooray! Okay, now this thing has lots and lots of moving parts, which again, we're not interested in chapter one, other than to show you that some of these things are keywords like public and see how they're, they're colored in blue? So obviously the blue things kind of sort of mean something. Uh, those are keywords that you can't use elsewhere. In other words, package always needs package, public and class and static and void. Those are all keywords. And then something is in green and something is in these other colors. So yeah, we'll go into that a little more detail. But so the reserve, the reserve words are color coded to make sure you don't kind of mess them up. Kind of cool. Okay. So <laughs> let's continue on since we, hey, we just did our first application. Yay. All right. So let's take a look at the keywords. Uh, believe it or not, there's not that many keywords, which is probably a good thing. Uh, 53 of these guys? I mean, that's not bad, right? You could probably get to learn that without too much trouble. Um, so the punctuation part, there were some curly braces and some semicolons back in here. So uh, some curly braces and a curly brace here and some some uh, a semicolon at the end and some parentheses, all that's part of that, that punctuation part, okay? And so, yeah, we're going to learn all that stuff, um, but really not now. And then variable names. We don't have any variables in our application here. We could have, but I didn't bother. Okay, so variable. Later on, we'll talk about this again, so don't get too wrapped up around the axle. But uh, a spot in memory is where we store stuff. If I say hours work equals 40, well, then 40 gets stored in a chunk of of memory. Well, I don't want to have to talk to that memory by its memory address. Its memory address is, you know, 84,764,842. I don't want to remember that. And so you give a name to that spot in memory called hours. Isn't that so much easier than rattling off some horrible number? So all a, a variable is, is a named spot in memory. That's it. Okay. So the compiler and the Java virtual machine. Java virtual machine is, is almost the same thing as the Java runtime engine. They are, I, I tend to use the two words synonymously, although technically they're not. Um, so you write an application using an IDE, okay, an integrated development environment, in this case, NetBeans. Um, and then you run the compiler and then the Java runtime picks up and finishes the process, which is back what this little doodad here was all about. So I, I have the source code, which says, you know, system out print ln hello world. It got run through the Java compiler to create a bytecode. And then it got run through a Java virtual machine to, to app run it on my machine. Right now, that application will run on Linux and Unix and Mac. Yep, it'll do it right now. I don't have to do anything more. All I have to do is grab this byte code and pass it off to that guy. Cool? All right. So you write the source code, which is just a text file. Um, by the way, uh, if I was to stop and look, where is this stuff? You know, I just created an application. Where the heck is it? Well, if I, if I go to my documentation, uh, NetBeans, um, you're going to find chapter one and you're going to find source and you're going to have to go through here. And here's the, a, a file called Java. So something that ends in Java is the source code. Okay, cool. And it gets translated into that intermediate code. And then the file, when you're, when it's done with that, uh, it, it changes it into something called dot class. Cool. So that's how you can just look at the file extension. You can tell, am I looking at the source code or am I looking at the byte code? Cool. All right. So one more time, why is it a two-step process? Why do we have to do this thing twice? I mean, why do we have to compile it once and then turn right around and, and basically compile it a second time? Why do we have to do that? Well, it's because I want this thing to be universal. And so to, to make it universal, I have to have the Java virtual machine installed on all these other systems and it can understand what this thing means and do that last bit of translation as it goes. So it's all about 
making it run on anything that where the Java virtual machine exists. Okay, the next thing to talk about is the, the Java software editions. And this, this gets a little complicated, I, I am sorry. Um, I mentioned in the, in the install video that it used to be that you would go to, to the Java website and you would pull down the latest JRE, the latest runtime environment, the latest Java virtual machine. Uh, now we don't do that anymore. Uh, our applications, for example, here, I do not have a JRE installed on, on this machine at all. And yet we ran this application. How do we do that? I just told you that this Java virtual machine is required. Well, it is. It got installed with the JDK, the Java Development Kit. I didn't have to download anything else to make it work. Okay. So the runtime used to be a separate download, uh, what they call a monolithic monolithic download, which contains all of the pieces you might possibly use. Well, now they don't do that. They just bundle the piece. What happens is the machine looks at your application and goes, well, you don't need that and that and that. For example, our, our little application, it, it didn't use printing. It didn't use the network. It didn't use the graphics, right? So it, it didn't need the entire thing. It just needed like one, this little piece over here and this little piece over there. So it bundled it together to make them smaller and easier to deal with. Okay. It also solved the problem of I'm running a different version of the runtime as you are, and therefore I got a different user experience than you did. Okay. I mentioned that in the in the install video that the, the licensing uh, has changed for the JDK. And so a lot of people have to pay for it. They used to be able to get it for free. Uh, there's an alternative called Open JDK. Okay. So you don't have to use the... The Oracle one, you can use the open source one. It works just as well. And then there's different versions. There's the standard version versus the enterprise version version versus the micro version. And we're just going to be using the standard edition. The enterprise edition is more for like doing stuff on the web and stuff. And we're not going to get there, at least not in this class. On page 14, they talk about um, compiling and running. Now, if you wanted to pop out to the, the command prompt to run this, by the way, it says here, um, if I'm going to go ahead, and, uh, I'm going to do something different here. Just bear with me for a minute. I'm going I'm to do a thing called build. Build doesn't actually make the application run. It just does that compile step and stops. Okay, cool. And then it says to run this application from the command line, try this. And then it tells you basically all you have to do is just copy this and paste it into the command prompt and this sucker will run. Well, kind of, not exactly. What we need to do is we need to go to our system and add some things to the uh, an environmental variable. We need to change the path because it's not going to find where Java is. So for example, if I pop out to the command prompt and just type the word Java, the machine's going to come back and say, huh, what the heck are you talking about? So we need to fix that so when I type Java, it actually knows where to do that. Okay, so here's how this thing works. First of all, I'm gonna need to, to know the path to the Java command. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna go to, uh, this is a 64-bit application, so it's in program files, and then Java, then JDK, and then bin. So I'm gonna light this guy up and hit control, well, copy. I just wanna copy that guy. All right, so next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the control panel on my Windows guy, and then I'm going to go to system. And then I'm going to go to advanced. And then I'm going to hit the, the, the make sure I'm on the advanced tab. And there's a thing here called environmental variables. I'm going to click that. I'm going to go to path. I'm going to tell it I want to edit this guy. And then I'm going to add this guy onto the end. I just did a control V. And that's it. Okay. Cool. All right. So I have now added that on. So now when I type Java, it's going to, well, it, it, it would. Okay. I've changed the environmental variable, but I haven't actually logged in or logged back in or done anything to make that part work. So it, trust me, we fixed it. So if you try this again, it will actually work. Okay. We're coming up on the 15 minute mark. So you guys by now know how this works.